We'd like to thank SAP, the sponsor of this session, entitled Performance Metrics That Matter, Choosing Information Over Data. During this session, you will learn how real-time performance measurement systems need to be the first step in getting incremental business value from computer-based automation and information systems. The speaker for this session today is Peter G. Martin, PhD, VP, and GM of Performance Management and Vensus Process Systems. Dr. Martin, Dr. Martin joined the Foxborough Company in the 1970s and has worked in a variety of positions in training, engineering, product planning, marketing, and strategic planning. He left Foxborough to become the Vice President for Intech Controls. He then went to Automation Research Corporation before returning to Invensys in 1996. <coughs> Since returning to Foxborough, he has been both VP of Marketing and Chief Marketing Officer for Invensys. Dr. Martin holds multiple patents, including the patent for dynamic performance measures, real-time activity-based costing, closed-loop business control, and asset and resource modeling, for which Fortune recently named him the hero of U.S. manufacturing. Now, without further delay, please welcome Dr. Martin. Thank you, and thank you all. I, I have to tell you, I'm completely relieved that somebody showed up. I, I was afraid at the end of the session that everybody had to go through some terrific plant tours and, to be honest with you, some very good presentations I've seen some of the other folks. Uh, I was afraid that you wouldn't have it. You'd be all waiting for lunch, but thank you for being here. I appreciate that. And if you listen to my bio, you've got two things out of it. One is I'm old, and two, I can't hold a job. So if you have that much, you're doing all right. I, what I would like to do is take a slightly different angle of life than maybe you've seen in the past. Um, about 20 years ago now, we started to recognize that there was a lot of great things going on at the plant floor, and that the executives didn't seem to understand what was happening. There was a, a, a disconnect, it seemed, in our minds between the CEOs and all the good work that was taking place on the plant floor. So we decided to ask a few executives what was going on, what they saw going on. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is almost entirely feedback from executives of your companies and other companies throughout the world. Now, I will admit that a large majority of the companies we talked to were process manufacturers. Exxon, Mobile, BPM, but we did move into the street as well. Over the past, let's say, decade, uh, we've included over 1,500 C-level and Vice President-level executives in the study. So I thought it would be kind of nice for you to take a look at maybe what your executives are thinking and how maybe we can align with what they're trying to accomplish. So the idea here is uh, let's take a look at performance measures that matter. The agenda that I'm going to go through is very simple. I want to talk about what your C-level executives told us, what we heard. And this is just composited information, just feedback to you, followed by a concept called real-time finance and accounting, real-time strategic alignment, the economic optimization of plant assets, and finally, how do you get started, some strategies for success. So that's the way I'd like to flow through it, and hopefully you'll pick up a little something out of it. Um, first thing we did was we set up a <coughs> design of experiment where we could find executives. By the way, it's very difficult to do executive research. I don't know if any of you have ever tried, but executives don't fill out surveys. They don't do any of the standard things you expect when you're trying to do research. So you have to go sit in front of them. So the only model of experiment we could come up with, design of experiment, was what was called an iterative interview process. And the concept there was to interview about 20 CEOs, try to figure out if you could find some problem or some way of compositing what they were telling us, go back to them as a check. Is this what you told us? Add another 20. And do that twice, over the second phase would be 40. So we started with 80 executives. And it was just trying to find out what was going on. They stood pretty high. When we started talking to them, they were fairly high up in terms of the drivers that they were talking about. This shouldn't be surprising to you. First thing was globalization. Globalization is driving these executives and driving their executives out of their mind. <coughs> globalization sounds good. When you sit there and you talk about globalization, I mean, it's a fun word to say, but it's a tough word to deal with. 
It's very, very difficult. Globalization has a correlate, and it's called equalization of economies. When you globalize, economies equalize. The thing that's amazing me through globalization activities is how well some of the advanced economies have been able to do in spite of globalization. The U.S. economy was a top economy when globalization started. By the way, what it means when you globalize is those other economies either come up to you or you go down to them or some combination of the two. It's a top fight. This is why manufacturing operations have been moved offshore and all these other things. Let's look to the low cost of manufacturing. They've come up with all kinds of crazy ways of dealing with globalization, but it's tough. It's very difficult. Second is shareholder expectations. And by the way, the, sh the stock market has gone just as crazy during this 15 year period as the global economy has gone. You know, any of you who invest in the stock market, any of you who invest in the stock market trying to make money, so you put money in a, in a company and then three weeks later you shift it out and go to another company, three weeks later you shift it out and go to another company, you're the culprits. You're the ones causing the problem because what that means to an executive team is they have to figure out how to keep your three week time window invested in their company. How do we keep your money in our country. That's the game they have to play. So what's happened, for those of you who play the market this way, what's happened is we've driven a behavior where strategy is two weeks out. You don't think beyond two weeks out because you can't survive beyond two weeks out. You've got to fight for that money in the stock market. So shareholder expectations are very difficult. Customer expectations are getting tougher and tougher and tougher. Globalization prices. You may be facing competitors from Asia that you've never faced before, and they have different features in their products. They have different capabilities, maybe a different cost structure. A resource availability, if you're into the resource-based industries. Uh, we were dealing with a company in Arizona that makes copper. Their ore content was about 3%. When we went down to Peru, we found a company making copper who had double the ore content. Double the five copper content of the ore. They could extract the copper for about 60% of the cost. And now they were coming up, and even with shipping costs, they could sell their product to the U.S. market for less than a U.S. company could manufacture. Needless to say, the U.S. company was acquired by the Peruvian company, which was acquired by a Chilean company two years later, who had a better ore content, which, by the way, was acquired by a Mexican company. Two years later, and that's the environment where it is. It's a top environment. Resource availability is not just natural resources, it's also human resources. Very often, you know, we as those of us who are Americans often thought, well, gee, we're well educated, we can keep ourselves going that way. All of a sudden, you go to India, you've got a well educated engineering base over there. And they cost about half the amount that we cost. We have some really difficult things to deal with. Aging equipment and workforce. When we're in, a, in an industrialized part of the world, you've been industrialized for a while, you're equipped and you're equipped with daisy, how do you deal with that? You can understand, when I joined the Foxboro Company in 1970, the average age of an engineer in a plant was my age. Today, when I go around from plant to plant, the average age of an engineer in a plant is my age. We have a problem. The talent base is getting older, it's getting people to leave the marketplace. How do we capture this knowledge? This one is amazing. It's one that we may not notice working out in the plant pool. The speed of business has gotten hugely fast. It's gotten faster and faster and faster. Do you realize that 15 years ago, most industrial companies could set up energy contracts that were for a year? You could set up an energy contract with your energy supplier that was a year long, which meant energy was essentially a constant. Today in the United States, in most parts of the United States, if you're buying energy, the price changes per hour. Energy is no longer a constant. If you move to Spain, it's real time. They, are, they give you a five minute notice of a price change and you better be able to deal with it. <coughs> Speed of business has changed. I'm working in a company in South Africa right now with their material costs change multiple times a day. When you have that type of business environment that you're working in, the plant floor is not the only real-time world anymore. The 
plan for is real time, but so is the business that you're working within. And that's very difficult. And it leads to a loss of operational control. <coughs> Any of you who are control engineers in the room understand that as you move down a control hierarchy, the lower level controllers have to be the fastest ones in the business. If you have something changing above a controller faster than the controller can react to it, you get into an out of control condition very, very quickly. So all of a sudden the business is moving as fast as the plant floor is moving. We have a loss of operational control. And finally, and by the way, this is their phrase, not mine. They said, we're in an environment that they call death by initiative. The executives blame themselves for death by initiative. You've got to understand, in the United States, according to business, the average CEO of an industrial environment is his tenure is less than three years. They have less than three years to prove their results. That's it. They get hired. Last year, of all new CEOs hired in the United States in industrial operations, 26% lost their job within the first year. This is the environment they're in. And what they have to do is prove to their board of directors that they're doing something. So if they come in, if you got a new executive that comes into your operation and you're doing Six Sigma and you're doing it well and things are going well, that's not in their best interest. That's not a good thing for them. So what we have to do, if we're doing Six Sigma, oh God, what am I going to do? Me. Let's do me. Well, what is lean? I don't know, but it's different than Six Sigma. So I can go back to the board of directors and say, you know, you were only doing Six Sigma before I came. Now we're doing lean. Good luck to the next CEO. We've used up most of the words in all this decade. I mean, and some of the words have been technical, some of them have been continuous improvement. I mean, I've been amazed at how many new phrases associated with continuous improvement I learned at this session, at this conference. It's amazing. Every time you turn around, there's a new phrase. That's great. The executives will love you for that. Then we move, so we move from the CEOs down to the CEOs of the uh, CFO. And the issue there, when we talk to them, we try to get them in the room together. Because it's fascinating to get a chief financial officer sitting with the chief operating officer. They don't see life the same way at all. It's, it's fun to listen to the discussion. It's kind of enjoyable. You know, there's some good fights going. But as we did it, one of their issues was strategic alignment. The COOs were at their wit's end because they were performing brilliantly to all their KPIs. And the CFO thought they were doing a lousy job. How can that be? How can you be performing brilliantly to your key performance indicators? And the CFO, who measures the business, by the way, thinks you're doing a lousy job. There's no transparency. Nobody can tell. The CFO cannot tell whether you're making money or losing money down the play for. It's completely invisible. There's no transparency at all. There's no ability to sense and respond. I was listening to a talk earlier this morning that was talking about the fact that it takes three to four weeks sometimes for a market condition change to be felt in the plan and responded to. By the way, same thing could be true right in the plan. There could be some change in raw material or change in catalyst, and it takes a while to sense and respond to it. They want to impact the outcome. If we make this change, will it work or won't it work? Will it have the results or won't it have the results? They don't have a clue. And the ability to close the loop, this is an interesting one. Because for years, we've thought about the IT organization as being a level above the plant floor, technologically. And then you've got the plant floor organization doing all the closed loop control, machine control, things like that. And the fear has been when we break down that barrier and IT and, and automation comes together, the IT world will take over and the automation world will go away. But the truth is, we're going into a real-time world. It's the people who understand real-time, who understand how to respond in a real-time sense that should be taking over or working to drive a real-time operation. If the business parameters are changing in real-time, we need the people who understand real-time to deal with it. Now, think about this. Cost accounting. Cost accounting was invented in manufacturing and textile operations about 200 years ago. And when it was first invented, according to Dr. Robin Cooper at Harvard University, it was bottom up. As you make things, it comes for them. But then we started making things too quickly. 
So bottom up accounting was impractical. So we compromised when we went to monthly accounting. Let's just cut up the amount of stuff we did, look at the electric bill, look at the wool bill, whatever. Balance it all out, we'll come up with something called a variance report. Makes sense, and we'll use it. Well, the reason we went to that approach for accounting was because there was no practical way to change it. So what did we do? We went out and got people PhDs in how to account for things the wrong way. <laughs> now once you get a PhD, you think you know everything. So you account for things the wrong way, you're never going to change it. We've got to start changing the way we think. If we don't change the way we think, we're not going to be able to respond to the real-time world. And the people who lead the charge in the industrial world, in the manufacturing world, and responding to the real-time aspects of that's going on, have got to be the plant for people. You're the real-time people. You're the people that can go back to the bottom-up concepts. And that's what your executives are talking about. Here's a chart that comes out of the Aberdeen group called the Transparent Factory talking about when they interviewed CEOs, what their top concerns were, and we'll see the biggest concern is proactively managing production. They don't believe, really, you realize that most executives don't believe they can proactively manage the production of their enterprises. They believe each individual plant might be doing okay, but across the enterprise, they can't deal with it. But uh, executive visibility into the production process, they don't know what they're making clear and when. Most executives said to us that they don't even know if they've had a good month until five days after the end of the month when the finances is They don't have a clue if they're doing well. And if they pick it up, they weren't doing well halfway through, they may have been able to do something about it, but it's too late now. Financial visibility into the plan form. The first three issues that the executives came up with on the Aberdeen list all had to do with managing production and financial visibility. We've got to do things a little bit differently. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about debt by initiative, because I'm going to get a chuckle out of this. It's a fun thing. Those of you who are old, as old as me have seen so many initiatives, sometimes you can't discern them. It's, it's difficult to list them out. But here, there, there are two types of initiatives that we've seen over the years. Performance improvement initiatives. We're going to make these babies up. And performance measurement initiatives. So the performance improvement initiatives is some of good ones in here. Uh, Sim, you guys are familiar with Sim? Computer Integrated Manufacturing, love Sam. I love it. I was the vice president of Sam at my company, and I had no idea what Sam was. But I was vice president of it. So whenever anybody came up to me and said, what's Sam? I just made sure I talked very fast and used logarithm and exponential. I had no idea what Sam was. I figured that if I was vice president of Sam, I better find out what it is I'm vice president of. So I went around and started talking to a bunch of experts. And my composite definition of SIM, I finally figured it out. My composite definition, I got five of them to figure it out. My composite definition of SIM is if you connect all the computers in your plant together, something good is bound to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so we spent quite billions of dollars on system integrators and connecting everything together, and I was never quite sure if anything good happened. And then we had lights out. I always loved lights out manufacturing. Remember lights out? You know, if we automate everything the way we could, we don't need people. If we don't need people, we don't need lights. I remember talking to an operations manager. He said to me, you know, we went to lights out manufacturing. The problem is our operators couldn't find any way to control them. <laughs> but you look at all of these, and it's not that these things aren't good. <laughs> the concept behind each one of these is good. The problem is, it's an initiative. If you, if you don't look at the problem holistically, you start focusing on the wrong things. Now on the measurement side, we've had a bunch of initiatives as well. ERP finance. Remember 15 years ago, everybody had to put an ERP system in. Life as we know it would be good. You get ERP in there, bang, everything's going to be better. Was everything better? No. But it's not because the ERP systems weren't good, it's because we, we dealt with them as an initiative. They did some good things. They have the scorecards. I do love that one. That's a good one. You know, I, I actually love Kaplan and uh, Norton. They did a great job with them scorecards. They opened up our whole mind. But what they had to do was move us to a point which was not where they wanted to go, just to get us to think of it. It's a good concept. It's a great concept. Economic value add, KPIs. Initiative after initiative after initiative, every time you turn around, you have a new initiative. What does that mean to you? 
You're getting cognitive. You know, you, you, you're black belt this month, and black belt's not worth anything next month, so on and so forth. You're getting cognitive. We've got to get out of the initiative mindset. Your executives are saying that they know this is wrong. By the way, they know a lot of these things are good. But they know the initiative approach to these things is wrong. We have to start looking at things from a more systematic perspective. The overall business, holistically, we have to take a look at all these things. We have to go the right direction. So one of the things we started looking at was return on asset. Why all the initiatives? That was the question. Why all the initiatives? Business, you know, business should be simpler than this. So when we started talking to the executives, they said the one thing they'd like to get a better feel on from all their assets is the return on asset. You know, whether you be doing it as a return on investment perspective or life cycle return on asset, it doesn't matter. So I went and we found a uh, textbook on ROI, ROA. This drawing comes right out of the textbook. Return on asset is the calculation you do when you buy a capital asset. Okay, you've got the price, you've got the installation cost, the engineering cost, and in theory, at some point in time, the thing's working. And then you run it for a number of years, and the cost starts going up to the end of the asset life because it gets old, it needs repair, you need more training, so on and so forth. That's the cost of the asset, it's the asset cost. Then you've got the benefit from the asset, right? We all are good at benefit from asset before we buy it. Right? What we do is, you're gonna, if you want to buy an asset, by the way, this could be a PC. See, I'm a, I'm a manager. When people have to buy PCs, I figured this out really well. You know, we've had the same PC for the last five years. I need an upgrade. All right? I call up the finance guy. What is the return on capital that you need to get this year in order to justify the, the capital expenditure? Well, 27%. Well, this PC is worth 28%. <laughs> I'll guarantee you it is. I'm going to be 1% higher and then I'll justify it. After the fact, we have to go back and figure out whether it got us 27% down. <laughs> Most of the assets we buy don't. Why? Because the problem we have is we're in a capital intensive business where the cost of capital is measured and the benefit of the capital is not measured. See, do you understand what your issue is? Your cost is measured. When you do a project in your plants, the cost of that pro project <coughs> is very visible. The benefit from the project is not being measured by anybody. It's being projected up front, but after the fact, nobody's measuring the benefit from your project. So, let's forget the chief operating officer for a second. Whose job is it in your company to determine whether or not that investment paid back? It's not the COO. It's the CFO. Right, it's financial people. Let me ask you something. If you don't know whether an investment paid back, what is a finance guy going to say? No. no. Every time. Have you ever met such negative people in your life? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Just because we can't prove it. Come on. <laughs> you know, have you ever met a finance person with you and said, you know, we got to work on these things. <laughs> but part of the problem is, from our perspective, unless we can get visibility into the value of what we do, we're going to be looked at as a cost center. Do you realize over the past 15 years in industrial operations, the number one organization that was downsized was engineering, and number two was IT. That means that somebody up there doesn't believe this curve. If you're being downsized, if your organizations are being downsized, if the plant floor focus is being downsized, we are not grooming our kids. And the executives are asking us to think differently about this. That's when we started looking at real-time finance. Now, I, I am going to talk about accounting for a few seconds. Don't run out of the room. It's okay. We'll get through. I know one thing through my travels is engineers and operations people don't like accountants. Very simple. The good news is they don't like you either. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have a problem in industry. The problem is not technology. The problem is people. You know, nobody likes anybody. Have you ever noticed that? Maintenance and operations. Do they like each other? No. No, maintenance operations and engineering. They don't like each other either. Engineering, and, well, nobody likes each other. So, <laughs> you know, so what I want to do is look at real time finance. What, what we had to do in order to move to this direction to see how we could solve this problem. By the way, this problem is solvable. I want to be clear about that. But in order to solve it, we have to solve it from the perspective of your executives. 
If the CFO, COO, CEO don't agree that you're driving value, they're not. So let's solve it. So what we did was we decided to run a couple of focus groups. Now, I don't know if you know what a focus group is, but we wanted to get about 40 C-level executives together in a room at the same time. That's a challenge. How do you get C-level executives to go get together in a room at the same time? Like this, you know, if you don't get anything else from this talk, get ready to write this down. I'm giving you a very important input. If you want to get executives together, offer golf. <laughs> golf, it's the only thing that works. We sponsored the PGA golf tournament in Las Vegas and said if you would like to golf with Jim Furyk, which we'll let you do, you have to sit in a meeting with Peter Martin for two hours, and about three quarters of them about it up, it's too much fun. <laughs> but we got enough to have the focus group. And so what we did, by the way, focus group by my definition is a controlled argument. One thing I didn't realize was you get a bunch of executives together and arguing is going to break out. The only thing you have to do is make sure they're arguing about what you want to argue about. <laughs> you know, they'll argue about anything. So I was standing up there and I was trying to get a discussion going. And the way I chose to get it going and to focus it on what we wanted them to talk about was I went to Gartner Group, which is a consultant in the industry, and I asked them to draw one of their famous pictures of how automation and IT all fits together. So they, they use little rectangles with three letter acronyms. Actually, they moved up to four letters. You know, you know, like you have PLC, CNC, DCS, SCM, CRM, and they have lines going between them, showing how it all connects together. And it looks like it looks like a spider's nest with little things cut in. And I stood up and I was saying, this is the way that there were 48 boxes. Let's see if I reckon. They started with 46, but we added two boxes in there with random three letters. This is <laughs> nobody would say anything. Nobody's ever going to say. So I'm standing up there, talking in front of this group of 40 executives trying to explain the story. And one of the executives got up and out of the chair, walked up behind me. I thought he had to go to the bedroom. Well, no, he walked up behind me, grabbed the door in my hand, walked over to his trash can, and threw it in the trash can. Now, that, you may think that's not a really good way to start a meeting, <laughs> but we figured an argument was about to break out. <laughs> so what I did was I handed them the felt tip marker as they go up to the whiteboard. I said, you should have something to say. He said, I do have something to say. If you think that's the way I run my business, no wonder I can't get out of my business no matter what. I don't run my business that way. I'm much simpler than you people. You people think much differently than I do. I said, show us how you run your business. And he drew a box. Wrote CEO in it. He said, I'm the CEO. I run the business. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> he went. And then he said, I don't do two things. I don't do 48. And by the way, what are those two three letter I know? He said, I only do two things. I measure my business and I operate my business. Don't get confused. To measure my business, I have a chief financial officer. To operate my business, I have a chief operating officer. He put the felt in. Hit that pen down and started walking back to his chair. Now that may not look that astounding to you. That's a pretty simple diamond. But the first argument broke up. One of the CFOs raised his hand and said, wait a second. Hold. Oh, I don't agree with you. The CEO turned, well, this was not a guy who wanted to disagree with. He turned around and said, what? He said, I don't agree with you. My job is not to measure the business. My job is to do financial reporting. You've got it wrong. The CEO turned around and said, See, this is the problem. I think your job is to mention the business. You know. We have a problem. By the way, you, everybody in this room, has a problem because your CFO doesn't think the right way. They're not measuring the business. You go down on your plant floor, you make 140 changes in a month. Your CFO is measuring the overall business on a monthly basis for financial reporting. How much value do you think they can discern in those 140 things they did you? Now, even if the value was there, it's not visible. It lacks visibility. So, when we started this focus group, we actually hired Dr. Robin Gupta from Harvard University. Robin um, headed up the cost accounting uh, department at Harvard Business School. The reason I hired him is we were all engineers. We needed somebody with a cost company background to be in there to make sure we weren't going too far off. So what Robin did was he stopped the argument and he said, okay, look, show us under these two headings how you automate your enterprises. And so they drew this picture. 
as about an hour and a half behind it. They do this picture. They said our automation and IT organizations break down into three levels above the plants. <coughs> this is the plants. The plants have sensors and actuators and plants. Above that, we do plant asset management type things. And by that, by the way, these are executives. For them, asset management did not mean maintenance. It meant managing the assets for business value. We do production management, scheduling, planning, things like that. And we do what they call enterprise management. The primary divider is time. There's certain things that run in real time, certain things that run more on a daily schedule. This is their drawing, not mine. I don't agree with the time frames necessarily, but this is what they see it. Certain things that run monthly, and they were talking, and they were convention, and they were proud of themselves over this beautiful model. And about an hour and a half into the meeting, Ronald Cooper stood up and said, wait a second. I thought you said you did two things. If you notice, they completely ignored the left-hand side of their picture. They said, oh yeah, that's right. The way we do financials is we do monthly financial reporting on our VRP system. That's it. That's all. There's the model. That's where they ended the day. They went out golfing right after that. <laughs> By the way, it, you should, you know, if you ever want to have a good time, have an, an executive focus group of golf of it. You should see the way they come dressed. It's amazing. Some of them are bloomers, you know, and they couldn't golf. They look good, but they couldn't golf. But if you look at this model, you should understand one thing about humans. We don't work in an unbalanced way. We work in a balanced way. This is a human model, which means it's so out of balance that something is wrong. This model is completely out of balance, and it represents from our follow-up research, about 100% of the times we went on to look at. There were one or two that got close, but 100% of the close. That means anything you do here and here is not measurable here. It's invisible. By the way, most of you work here here. What you do, your CFO can't see. It's invisible to So what do they do? They cut capital budgets. They redirect capital to other directions. We've got to get them to reinvest with the value. I want to tell you something. In a manufacturing organization, most of the value can be generated in the plant. You, you are owning the value of your company. We just got to, we got to state our claim to that. The interesting thing about this was when we were showing this picture, and there was a little argument going on, one of the chief operating officers, who hadn't said a word during this whole thing, raised his hand. And then we called on, we said, look, I'm going to tell you something. I knew this. You didn't have to show me this. I know that the CFO isn't doing this job. We were telling him that the year. <laughs> he said, but don't worry about it. I solved the problem over here. I know they don't measure the business, so I do. I developed my key performance indicators. And I measure the business. And the CFO stood up said, if one more operations group comes in with one more KPI to tell me how much money he made my business, I'll fire his ass. <laughs> we got a problem. There's a lack of alignment. We're not looking at things right. The, the, the CPO, when the CPO wants to know whether or not you did, did something right that added value, the CPO does not go here. The CPO, CPO goes there. We spent the last 150 years ignoring the finances. We can't anymore. Life has got to change. When you look at what you get out of the finance team today, nine out of 10 plants get a monthly variance report, and that's the only measure you get that even gets close to telling you how you do it. Cost per unit product made, standard, which means expected value, versus actual value. By the way, in 1900, if you take a look at that statistic, according to the Consortium of the Dance Manufacturing International, if you look at that statistic, cost over unit product made in 1900, about 95% of the cost was direct cost within the plant. By 1990, that number dropped below within 50%, which means that if you're in a plant, you have less than 50% control over the numerator of the, of the measure you're being measured to, less than 50% control. Buried in that numerator is the cost of the president's company car. You have no control over that. It's all allocated out. If you can't control the numerator, what do you do? 
I do all those sixth grade math. Then you can't do the numerator. You go to the denominator. What do you do with the denominator? Make it as big as possible. Make as much credit as you can at a given point in time. If there's no place to put it, store it. You know, build warehouses. Do something to it. Put it in closets. Doesn't matter as long as you're making your marriage go. This drives bad behavior. You all know this. I've seen too many talks today about how this drives bad behavior. This is bad. Not only that, do you realize that the same exact barrier support is used if you're making Levi blue jeans custom work as if you're making um, refined gasoline on a maximum board? Same barrier support. Come on, they can't be the same. You, they can't be the same performance. That's crazy. That's what we've got to break here. So now we're going to be found in. There are plenty of measures out there, but there's a brick wall between them. And the brick wall is hard to overcome. You've got the direct plant floor measures, we you measure the speeds, temperatures, things like that right in the plant. You've got KPIs, and then you've got the financial measures, and they just don't link together, and that's the problem. But what we found was, if we suck it up a little bit, and started saying, okay, we need the accountants have, a, have something to add to this whole process, and we got the accountants and the engineers together, an interesting conversation would break up. By the way, Peter Drucker, who the management science director who passed away about a year and a half ago, once said that 99% of all innovation that happens in the world happens when two unlike things come together. You know, you've got chocolate in my peanut butter, whatever it is. 99% is when two unlike, there are no further unlike things that come to the engineers. Okay, so pull them together. When we pull them together, what we found was the plant accounts were just as frustrated as you were. You've got to remember, they get beat up by the CFO as much as you could, maybe even more. And they're looking for a way of doing the job better. So if we look at what they really need to calculate, and we can write it out as equations, contribution margins, true cost of energy consumption, true material cost. And we decompose those equations down to the work cells and the areas right down to the plant floor. You can end up with a set of equations. Then you go to the engineer and you say, here's some equations. You've got a bunch of measurement devices up in that plant. See if you can model that equation on that measurement device. In other words, work backwards. Engineers are good at this. Just don't tell them it's an accounting equation. One of the problems we ended up with was a lot of guys have to the contribution margin. Have any of you ever seen a contribution margin calculation? Crazy. I mean, they're crazy calculations. Now, what do engineers do? They make it calculations better. Right? So we give them the contribution margin calculation. What do they do? They said, I can do a better job than this. And they changed it. And when the CFO had the police knocking on his door saying, wait a minute, you are not reporting things according to generally accepted accounting practices. We have some interesting situations, right? Don't try to fix accounting. The problem with engineering is engineering is based on physical sciences, natural sciences, chemistry, physics, mechanics. Accounting is unnatural. It's, it's an inmate science. Don't worry about what it is. Just do it. <laughs> but what we found out was if you could model these guys right down in the control system in, in a little visualization tool or a little calculation tool, if you could actually model them down there, then you could use tools like the real-time data historian which we're about to shift, month, day, year. I mean, you don't need all this accounting stuff. You can use the same tools you guys are already using. And build a little real time accounting system that's accurate, working out. What it does then is you, off of these sensors, you develop real time performance measures. By the way, I call them real time performance measures or dynamic performance measures, either term we use. Because I found if I call them real time activity based accounting models, engineers hate them. So I talked to Cooper, and Cooper said, you know, there's another phrase that we use in accounting called performance measure. Um, that sounds a little like an engineering issue. Why don't we use that? So we did that, and the engineers think they do with KPIs. It works. It works. You identify them, or okay. But what you can do is build your little real time business performance measure. Don't eliminate your KPIs. You can also do real time KPIs. Don't get rid of your KPIs. What we learned is by doing both the KPIs and the real time accounting measures, now you can see which one of those KPIs impact the bottom line the most. Uh, there was a diagram by. Um, Alice, uh, Alice Smith, who gave a presentation here last night, 
in which he showed 68 different key performance indicators of the people that did the And she said, if you have this many measures, you're not measuring anything. And she's right. Some of those measures have no bottom line impact. Some do. So if you actually can measure the real time, the accounting measures in the same time frame as you're measuring the KPIs, you can look at which KPIs performance aligned with bottom line performance and start focusing on those. And what we found you could do is provide that information to the operators in a feedback control loop, and all of a sudden you're not controlling the process anymore, you're controlling the process at a lower level, and you can actually close the loop on the business. You're controlling business variables there. By the way, you can cascade them up to daily or production cycle. Production cycle is what's the The daily. Close the loop at this level, right up to the reporting cycle. And all of a sudden, what you're doing is you're closing the loop between the way the financial people have to measure your business by law and the way you have to run your business in order to make them successful, and you're working to make your C level people successful. It's fundamentally simple, but it takes a change of mindset. The change is we've always thought of it from being taught down. This is going back 200 years and go and do it company bottom up. When I talked to Robin Cooper, the guy from Harvard Business School, and I was explaining to him, I said, you know, the state of the art in automation changes daily. I mean, if you pick up industry, which is something new, every time you get it, there's something invented, something new. He said, that's interesting because the state of the art in financials hasn't changed in 200 years. So we have a situation where on one side of this equation, we're applying all kinds of technology. On the other side, we're not applying any. Because we're thinking on, we're thinking backwards. But when you get this system in place, and you do sensor-based real-time accounting, you can now do a project and model that project and see how much that project makes. The problem is now, when we went back to the detectives and showed them this works, they said, that's great. How do I use it to make my people better? How do I empower my people with this information? I don't want to just fix an accounting problem. I want to fix a performance problem. I want my frontline operators to be able to perform differently and know when they're trying to value or when they're not trying to value. For this, we went over to Switzerland to uh, Dr. Tom Volman, who was one of my professors years ago at Boston University. And Volman developed, developed a strategy for decomposition model. He said, if any manufacturing market is a simple model, it's almost like playing to check access strategy. He said, in any manufacturing plant, you have strategy. Now, years ago, strategy, you know, I talked to, to General uh, Foods, and they said in the 1950s, they said the strategy in 1950, and then they looked at it again in 1965. Strategy didn't change much. The world didn't change much. But today, strategy is a changing record. In the power industry, it's not unusual to see the actual manufacturing production strategy in a plant change four or five times a day. Because they play the grid. The grid's working in real time. They have to think different in the day. What Fulton came up with was a model that says, develop a strategy. Your strategy can be surprised at two things. One is the statement. Here's my statement of strategy. That's good for hanging on a plaque in the lobby. And not much else. And the second one is a set of strategic objectives. This is what I'm going to do. That's good. Now you take the strategic objectives and out of each objective you develop an action plan. An action plan is a set of measurable steps that you're going to take to implement that strategy. And out of the action plan, you get a set of performance measures. It's strategy, action, measure. You develop the measures of the action steps. If you're not measuring the action steps, you're not, you know, you're not able to tell whether or not you were successful in what you did. Now, what we found was in the 1980s, that was done up at the corporate level, but by the 1990s, strategy started decomposing through the organization. We had the the visual executive team might look at the measures corporate was asking them to perform to do their strategy action measure analysis. The plan team would look at the measures the division had to perform to do their analysis and their stuff. So all of a sudden, there are all kinds of people down on the plant floor who are actually impacting the profitability of your business more than anybody else in your business, second by second, who have, are not tied into strategy at all. They don't have a clue. So as the strategy changes, nothing changes in the way you make the model. That's unacceptable. What we found was we could easily go down to area or work cell and decompose the strategy further like this. And when you do that and provide dashboards back to your, 
to your um, operators and your maintenance people and your engineering people, and those dashboards you change twice or three times a day, they get alignment with the strategy by having the right measures in front of them. The only thing this decomposition does is allow you to prioritize the KPIs and the real-time accounting measures as to which measure is most important right now to the strategy, which is second, which is third, which is fourth, and bang, the operator will know immediately when there's been a strategy change because they get a new dashboard, a new order for the measures, and they just start behaving differently. All of a sudden, everything starts to the same way. So what we're talking about is literally building control loops for the business. The control loop at the real-time level, the control loop at the transactional level, all the way up to the business level. And you see all the deep technology. I mean, if you walk around and see some of the technology you are seeing today, in terms of human machine interfaces, we can build the dashboards. What we have to do is make sure we have the right measures on them. And if you have the right measures on them, you'll be shot. I'm going to give you a statistic. On average, when we do this, and all we do is put the intelligence system in to empower the operators in the plant, the average 100% return on that investment occurs within three weeks. The people learn quicker. If you tell people what good it is, they will do good. Unfortunately, most of the people in our operations today don't know what good is. If you don't know what good is, it's hard to, it's hard to do, it's hard to perform. The average 100% return occurs within three weeks. By the way, the CFO starts seeing returns like that. The question is not going to be, oh, are we going to increase the capital budget again? The question is going to be, Where's the next project where I can get a three-week return? You give me a three-week return, I'll give you the money. Let's stop working on it. Let's stop making the performance of these operations. What we look at is different views from plant floor up to executives. Executives need to see different things than the operators do. You contextualize the information to the job. Don't try to get fancy. The marketing people of our companies hate these because they're useful. They're not great. You know, marketing people like things that are pretty, not necessarily useful. We like things that are useful and not pretty. We do it like this. The operator, we use a little demi up and down arrow, so on and so forth. This is the most important performance measure, second, third, and fourth. If there's a strategy change, what does the operator see? He sees an alarm, and then the order of the, of the uh, dial is changing. What we do is an instantaneous value on a dial, and the trend is to what that thing has done over the last whatever time parts of the area. That's it. They don't need to know anything else. Why do they want the down arrows? Because they're going to change. When strategy changes, they change. You've got to reorient them as quickly as you can. By the way, this is what we call real-time performance management top to bottom. We can tie it right up through the ERP level. We take it, uh, we develop some software. For example, within SAP CNM in the SAP room, I'll get, we develop a software in the SAP world that will get the real-time accounting data developed, dials and dashboards and views for the management. What's good about this? The management team is completely aligned with the right for There are grand yes. Here's the previous slide. Uh, you said that the uh, KPI has been changed uh, in real time. Oh, give us an example of what would cause the change. Okay, a, a good example, uh, you know, would be the most dynamic industry I've worked in is power right now, because the power generation be regulated, which means that they're out on an open grid competing for profitability. So if you're a company like Calpine Energy, Calpine has 63 generating points on the West Coast and up in the Canada. And their job is to figure out which plant should be putting power on the grid at what volumes at any time. The way they make their money is charging to the grid where there's best profitability. So it may be that they want the plant in northern Seattle to go to 50% production for the next few hours, and the plant in uh, San Francisco to go to 100% production, because San Francisco right now is is needing a power. What causes that? A thunderstorm. I mean, if you watch the grid, when a thunderstorm goes through in the summer, everything cools off, the air conditions come down, you get a lull in power, the price of power reduces, where with a thunderstorm it goes through, you get a high price of power. That's the type of world we're getting into. Now, the, the power industry tends to be a little bit more dynamic than a, a lot of the other industries we're in. But I'm working at a petrochemical plant, as I said, in South Africa. And they have an intermediate plant that feeds all the other plants. And those, depending on the draw those other plants need, the value of the intermediate changes. They do have a transfer price, which is about, but the value changes. So in the power plant, what you see is maybe at 10 o'clock in the morning, you see production 
is your number one performance measure. We want you to be producing at a hundred percent rate. Then at noon, all of a sudden you get alarmed and cost goes to your number one measure. Why? Because all of a sudden the price for charging the grid in this spot is going down. The hard part has been that we designed our plants for volume. If you look at the power industry, power plants are designed to run full out for 40 years to be recommissioned. Now we're actually going to go up and down and be agile. Even some of the industries you'd never expect would have to be agile. If they're going to make money, they have to be agile. So, does that example help a little bit? It, and by the way, power is the most dynamic, but we're seeing it everywhere. We're seeing it all over the marketplace. You you go into a cycle mining down in, in um, Tucson. Right in the lobby, they have the commodity price of copper. Why? Because it changes 20 times during the day. And it changes big time. You realize that copper, three and a half years ago, copper was selling at 58 cents a pound. Today it's selling at about $4. That matters. That really, really matters. And if it goes from four dollars to three sixty, you change the way you're doing it. It matters. And those are the types of things we've got to tell you. That's why we see trends that are kind of crazy trends. Things are all over the place at time. So the question then becomes, how can I use this information to optimize the performance of my assets? I, you know, we're down in plant four. You know, this stuff is all deep, but how does it impact my assets? Well, I'm going to give you one example, and the example is what I alluded to earlier. The two organizations in most plants that impact the performance of the plant the most second by second are maintenance and operations. And they don't like each other. We've already talked about them. The operations people are always complaining about maintenance shutting something down right when they need it. The maintenance people are complaining about the way the operations people run the plant. They don't like each other. And what we have to do is figure out how to put these together. When we talked to a bunch of managers, they told us the primary measure of maintenance was the availability of the asset. The primary measure of operators is the utilization of the asset. Availability, in a traditional sense, is, is whether they're up or down. It's getting more sophisticated now. I, I'm not sure availability is such a good measure. But the interesting thing about availability and utilization is that they relate to each other. So you've got operators trying to maximize utilization. Utilization is how you drive them. Availability is keeping the plant running. It's like a race car scenario. You've got the pit crew, you've got the driver. The pit crew can be sitting there. By the way, Henry Photosport is one of our clients that we sat down and went through all this fascinating perspective on this. The way the pit crews and the drivers work together. We had uh, Jeff Gordon and uh, some other guy. I'm not going to ask that This is awesome. But we have been working with us on this. And you know, the fascinating thing is they were telling us that they could be out with two laps left to go, and the pit crew could call them up and say, slow down five miles an hour. And, and I said, do you question them? They said, no, we slow down five miles an hour. They said, because the measure of the pit crew is not availability. The measure of me is not utilization. Nobody cares how I utilize the time. Nobody cares how they maintain the time. They care about one thing, that I win the race. What's the win? And the pit crew, when they say slow down five miles an hour, they say, if you don't, something bad is about to happen, and you won't win the race. And you don't even have to know what it is. Just slow down. <laughs> and he is saying, I don't want to be in the car with something bad happens. I'm going to slow down, and he wins the race. If the pit crew calls him into the pit with three laps left, no go. Because he knows the pit crew is not worrying about his utilization or availability, they not worrying about winning the race. If he doesn't go in, he won't win the race. So what's the win? In manufacturing asset management, how do we define the win? This is the big issue. Right now, makers and operations don't have a win. We have asset utilization, asset availability. One thing that's fascinating was when we mapped the real-time accounting measures against utilization and availability, we found that they were very directly related. Two of the, two of the KPIs that had the most impact on the economics of a plant are the ones we guessed at 50 years ago. Availability and utilization. And what we found was availability and utilization tend to be inverse terms. By the way, they're not nice and smooth like this. That's because I do this lot. And my PowerPoint skills are not that good, so we have to go with what I do. It's not nice and smooth like this, but it's inverse. Let me give you an example. An automobile is a complex asset, right? You have availability and utilization. If you want to maximize availability, leave it 
it in the garage. You know, keep it tuned up, leave it in the garage, your availability will be 100%, and utilization will be zero. If you want to maximize utilization, drive it the way my son drives my car. Now, I want to be clear about this. My son has come up with a concept that an automobile is like a computer. The gas pedal is an on-off switch. It can either be zero or one. He's the only person I know that can get up to 60 miles an hour in the garage. <laughs> so he's trying to do this. Now, the only hope we have is that he fought to open the garage door before we started up. Well, you can understand that as he drives the car, the projected availability goes down around the city. They fight each other. That's true in complex assets. What we do is model this relationship for each asset. How do you do that? Just, I mean, it'll be amazing to you. Just present this information to your operators and the native people. You'll be shocked at how fast they can adapt to it. You'll be shocked. Do you realize that mathematically we can't solve this problem? We can't do multiple objective optimization. We haven't figured it out yet. The only entity in the world that can solve a multiple objective optimization problem is a human with a sixth grade education. That's it. We can solve it. As a matter of fact, psychologists and psychiatrists have been trying to figure out how humans do it. Don't worry about it. Just give them the data and they'll be able to do it. Here, we want to maximize the process optimization, manufacturing optimization, as an industry. Those two things don't matter if you're not at optimizing the asset performance. You may have to give up some utilization to maximize asset performance. We work in a gas plant where they had compressor stations, 48 compressor stations. They were running full out. They were averaging three failures a, a, every month. When a compressor fails, it usually takes about three days to get back on line. We did an analysis of this, told them to reduce the utilization of the compressors by 1%. They went from three failures a month to one failure every six months. Do you know how much money that's worth? Then we went to a predictor. Make this get rid of that one. Because if you can predict that failure, you can shut that compressor down for an hour and fix it, rather than waiting for the three-day residual damage problem. So you can take this stuff and pull it together. Some strategies for success. Start getting teams together that will look at measurement top to bottom. I'm convinced that our whole industry started as a measurement industry. Then we forgot, we got so enamored by other things. We got enamored by logic control. We got enamored by advanced control. We got enamored by optimization. Oh, I hate my optimization. Right? You all go home. You go to sleep at night and you about optimization. We get enamored by these things. Let's get back to our roots. If we can't measure the business right, we can't control it, we can't improve it, let's start tying a full measurement system together. And when you do that, you have business measures. You can literally use control things. The theory a lot of us have been raised on, you can use control theory, not just to control the plan, but to control the business. Why is this important? Because your business is running at real time. The only way to control something in real time is to automate it. You can't do it with the You've got to automate it. We're getting to the point where we have to go from control of the plan floor to control of the business. I was talking to a friend of mine, Sadiq Dabai who used to be the uh, head of um, the manufacturing sector at SAP. And he was saying, you know, we're jealous of you and advances. You're a controls company. Looking at the balance sheet saying, well, you're jealous of us. Why? <laughs> he said, you're a controls company. We're a management company. I said, okay. And he said, you know what the difference is between management and control? And I said, I guess not. I would go follow it now. And he said, management is when you can't control something. If you can control it, do. If you can't, Engine. We've got to start giving some of the technologies we have and move them into the business program so that we're managing the business. And I've got to go into that. And uh, when you do that, that's when continuous improvement really has a problem. <coughs>